Today, we dive into the world of Adam Worth, the infamous criminal mastermind known as the Napoleon of crime. From his early years as a small-time thief to his later exploits as a master con artist and thief, we'll explore the life and legend of one of the most intriguing figures in criminal history. Today, the story of the man who stole millions and eluded capture for decades. Welcome to Capers and Cocktails, a true crime podcast that doesn't take itself too seriously and gives you something to enjoy while you listen. The following content may be disturbing to some. Discretion is advised. If you're enjoying one of our themed cocktails, ensure you're of legal drinking age and have fun, but drink responsibly. The Napoleon cocktail is an elegant and sophisticated drink, ideal for celebrations or anytime you want to treat yourself to something special. The history of the Napoleon cocktail is a bit murky, and there are, of course, different stories about its origin. There is a common belief that Napoleon Bonaparte, that, that French emperor, liked cognac so much that the drink was named after him in the early 20th century. The Napoleon cocktail, so another legend goes, was concocted in the early 20th century by a bartender at New York's Waldorf Astoria Hotel. The cocktail was supposedly named after the French emperor after a customer requested it because he wanted something as grand as Napoleon. Okay. The version of the cocktail that I'm doing has been adjusted. It was important to me to find ingredients that were more easily accessible and when possible ingredients that I already have. This version of the drink maintains its elegant nature, but is simple and has ingredients you can find at even the smallest liquor store. For the cocktail, you'll take two parts gin, a half a part Grand Marnier, and a half a part Vermouth Rosso, and add those to a shaker filled with ice. Shake, 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 and strain over fresh ice. For the mocktail version, take two parts non-alcoholic gin, a half a part orange juice, a half a part grape juice, and add them to the shaker with ice. Shake until well combined and chilled, strain over fresh ice, and then you can enjoy it like the little dictator that you are. Speaking of little dictators, today's episode is not about Napoleon Bonaparte, but it is about a master strategist and leader who was able to orchestrate complex heists and cons with precision and skill. It is about a man with a commanding presence and a charismatic personality. It is about a cunning genius. Capers and Cocktails fans, meet Adam Worth. In 1844, Adam Worth was born into a Jewish family somewhere in Eastern Germany. Adam was the oldest of the six, yes, six children of Barney and Esther Worth. The exact town in Germany where he was born isn't known. Adam's father was a tailor and the family struggled financially. Probably because of the promise of a better life, the family immigrated to the United States and settled in Cambridge, Massachusetts, a suburb just north of Boston, in 1849, when Adam was five years old. Adam grew up to be a smaller fella, somewhere between five foot four inches and five foot five inches tall. In adulthood, some would even call him Little Adam. At least one person would say that he had a bow leg deformity. He had very dark eyes, some would say almost black and big shaggy eyebrows. He had thick hair and a prominent nose. He had long slender fingers, which would be perfect for at least one of his early criminal endeavors. In 1858, as a 14-year-old, Adam ran away to Boston, leading a vagabond life for several months. He would drift to New York City two years later, taking his first and probably only honest job as a store clerk. And then in 1861, the Civil War broke out. A $1,000 or $34,000 in 2023 money signing bonus was enough to get Adam to fake his age as 20, he was only 17 at this point, and enlist. He joined the 34th Independent Battery on October 1st as a Union Army recruit. Because of his brilliance and drive, he was elevated to the rank of corporal in just one month after he enlisted. His promotion to sergeant occurred on May 27, 1862. The 34th took part in the Second Battle of Bull Run on August 30th, 1862. This was a major setback for the Union Army and in fact was downright wild bloodshed. Adam was brought to Seminary Hospital in Georgetown, DC after he was injured by shrapnel. Official documents indicate that he passed away there on September 25th. The thing is, 
Adam didn't die. A clerical error led to his being recorded as dead when he had really made a full recovery. Adam had a decision to make after learning of the error. He could fix it and return to the fight, or he might desert without any consequences. Union morale was rock bottom at the moment and soldiers were deserting in droves all around him. Adam decided to flee and officially declared himself dead. The conflict wasn't over for him though. For the first few years of the Civil War, US citizens were not required to join the military, AKA there was no draft yet. This was the reason that Adam had snagged that sweet signing bonus when he was 17. And because he was now dead, he might as well join up again and snag another sweet bonus. But why stick around to be killed or actually killed? Adam bounced around from regiment to regiment, collecting the bonus and moving on with a new name. The good times came to an end, however, in 1863, when the Union Army was running out of bodies. Sorry, but literally here. The Enrollment Act, the very first conscription statute establishing a national draft, was approved by Congress in March 1863. The draft was mandatory for all male citizens and immigrants over the age of 20 and under the age of 45. But Adam was a young, enterprising young man. This much we've already established. So upon hearing of a little loophole on that old draft law, he decided to exploit it as far as he could. You see, eligible men who were drafted into the Union Army might avoid military service by paying what they called a commutation fee of $300 to the government. This cost was prohibitive for many adult males and led many to believe that the wealthy might use it to avoid serving in the armed forces. Hmm, sounds familiar. Men who did not want to or were unable to serve in the armed forces could alternatively hire a substitute soldier for a fee. The replacement would then serve in the armed forces for the remainder of the original enlistment. Adam and others would take this bounty to serve in another man's stead and then, well, desert their enlistment, or I guess the enlistment of the lucky rich fella they were replacing. Repeat this process over and over and you can make a pretty penny, like Adam did, or at least he did until 1864, when he decided to switch to a less dangerous but still illegal trade because of government crackdowns on bounty jumpers. It turns out that this may have also been the start of his relationship with the Pinkerton Detective Agency, who had been charged to track down him and many other bounty jumpers. More on them later. Adam headed to New York City. By the mid 1860s, New York City was decidedly one of the largest concentrations of the seedy criminal underbelly in the whole world. Corruption was rampant from the top down and there was hardly a way to make an honest living in the city to begin with. It was in the midst of this culture that 20 year old little Adam became a pickpocket. That's how it starts, ladies and gentlemen, gateway crime. After being caught stealing a package from an Adams Express truck, he was given a three year term at Sing Sing. The big house or Sing Sing prison was a high security facility in Austin, New York. The prison opened in 1826 and was notorious then for its severe punishments and order. It was known for its silent system in which inmates were not permitted to speak to one another. Inmates at Sing Sing were made to work long hours smashing rocks and constructing cell blocks. Disease and violence were rampant in the overcrowded prison. In the late 19th century, when Adam was an inmate, flogging and other forms of corporal punishment were still used as severe penalties for rule breaking. Adam was put to work with other prisoners in the marble quarries nearby, where he was put in charge of warming frozen nitroglycerin, AKA dynamite. He would later say, quote, I never questioned the guard and I always wondered why he left when I put the brittle chunks in the stove. When one of the older inmates told me I could be blown to bits, I decided I had had enough of prison, end quote. He broke out only after a few weeks, apparently by sneaking out during a change of the guards at the marble quarry, where it was less well guarded. Good thing he got away too, as prison guards had orders to shoot anyone attempting to escape. Upon returning to New York City, he picked up some new mutton chops. And then Adam headed straight back to his illegal ways. Adam started working for Frederica or Marm Mandelbaum, a notorious criminal ringleader and his criminal patron, so to speak. 
Marm was an imposing woman weighing more than 250 pounds with black eyes, big black eyebrows, and a mop of tightly rolled black curls. Marm was a German immigrant herself, coming to the States alone as a young woman, but it seems she was tough as nails and could look after herself. Marm was a bit of a real life artful dodger, running a school near a police headquarters where children were taught to be expert pickpockets. Adam began planning larger heists with Marm's assistance around the year 1866, when he began targeting banks and stores. He committed his first bank robbery with his brother, John, and he began to gain quite a reputation in the New York City criminal underworld. It was in 1869 that he assisted safecracker Charlie Bullard's escape from the White Plains Jail with the assistance of Marm. He did this by tunneling into the prison where Charlie was held and bribing the guards to ignore the sounds. Charlie and Adam would soon become fast friends and longtime partners in crime, literally. Charlie was a well-educated man who is said to have had three great loves of his life, women, music, and gambling. He was a piano virtuoso and also a crime virtuoso in his own right. On November 20th, 1869, Adam and Charlie used another tunnel, this time from a nearby store, to steal from the vault of the Boylston National Bank in Boston. They managed to get away with $450,000 or $9.7 million 2023 dollars. That's inflation for you. It was obviously the talk of the town, and in fact appears to be the only thing that anyone in the whole city of Boston talked about for a week or so. After receiving a tip from the bank, the Pinkerton Detective Agency, back again and hot on the tail, followed the trail of the trunks Adam and Charlie had used to transport the stolen goods to New York. It was time to get the heck out of Dodge, or, well, New York City, so the two headed off to Europe. As Charlie would say, quote, those damn detectives will get on to us in a week. I don't want to be playing the piano in Ludlow Street Jail, end quote. Okay, let's recap. So by the time that Adam Worth had his 26th birthday, he'd already managed to run away from home, steal and escape from the U.S. Army several times, escape from one of the most notorious prisons of the 19th century, break another person out of jail, steal almost $10 million, and also flee prosecution and make it overseas unscathed. What are you doing with your life? <laughs> I should also say that Adam Worth really had a lot more heists than I'm even touching on in this episode. He had too many to mention. And for most of them, he did not get caught. Anyway, Charlie and Adam arrived in Liverpool and picked up fake identities. Adam borrowed the name of the late founder editor of the New York Times, Henry Jarvis Raymond. He would use this identity and persona as a well-respected gentleman for the rest of his life. At the first hotel bar they came upon, they met a Miss Catherine Louise Flynn, or Kitty, an Irish girl with thick curly blonde hair, stunning blue eyes, and charming dimples. Sophie Lyons, a criminal friend of Charlie and Adam, would say, quote, she was an unusually beautiful girl, a plump, dashing blonde, end quote. Perhaps unsurprisingly, at a mere 17 years old, Kitty became the object of both of their affections, and they began to vie for her attention. She married Charlie, but evidently she still liked Adam, or maybe more than liked. It seems most likely that the three had the late 19th century version of an open marriage. Kitty first became a mother in October 1870 when she gave birth to Lucy Adeline, and then again in October 1877 when she gave birth to Catherine Louise. It's unclear who the father of these two daughters was. Detective William Pinkerton of that Pinkerton Detective Agency was certain that Adam was the biological father of Kitty's two girls. After Kitty and Charlie got back from their honeymoon, the three moved to Paris. The year was 1871. At the time, the French police force, government, and people were still in shambles from the Paris Commune. From March 18th through May 28th of 1871, the Paris Commune, a revolutionary and socialist government, ruled Paris. Anarchists, socialists, and other leftist factions formed the government, which swiftly instituted several progressive measures, such as the separation of church and state, the elimination of conscription, the draft, cooperative ownership of business, and the introduction of free education. Radical. As the French government perceived the Paris Commune as a challenge to its authority, it fought it with all its might. A ferocious and bloody conflict broke out between government troops and commune sympathizers. 
In the end, the government prevailed and the commune was brutally put down, but the city was disordered, vulnerable, and partially in ruins. Adam, Kitty, and Charlie used this to their advantage. They opened up a pretty sweet place I'd like to have visited had I been alive in the late 19th century called the American Bar. The American Bar catered to expats, offering US newspapers and a place for them to pick up their mail. It had a restaurant and bar, which served exotic cocktails, just like we do here on Capers and Cocktails, on the first few floors, and a gambling den on the upper floors. Since gambling was strictly illegal in Paris at the time, the tables were made to collapse and disappear into the walls and floor. The American bar soon gained a reputation as the best place in Europe to hook up with other criminals, plan your next heist, or just hide out from the popo. Oh, Willie Pinkerton, or Willie P as we shall call him, I feel like there's a Willie P like every other episode. Anyway, he managed to show up to the American bar in 1873 on the hunt for Adam, it seems. And either the prospect of being recognized by Willie P or something else managed to convince Adam, Kitty, and Charlie to shut down the American bar. The three moved back to London where Adam became a bit of a marm Mandelbaum himself. He provided financial backing for heists, purchased information, bribed security personnel, and made sure that all actual criminal activity was carried out by persons who exclusively served as his uh, intermediates. As a matter of personal choice and to keep tensions low, he insisted that those working for him never resort to violence. In most cases, these go-betweens were his former American crime buddies. Adam would grab 25% of the profits from every job his guys did, which left them feeling, you know, fairly compensated while making, making Adam pretty wealthy and he didn't have to get his hands dirty. Meanwhile, Kitty and Charlie's relationship was falling apart. First of all, evidently Charlie was already married, something he had conveniently forgotten to tell Kitty. His first wife just showed up in London threatening to charge him with bigamy. At the time, bigamy was a criminal offense punishable by up to seven years in prison, but that was only half of the problems that, that Kitty saw. Most importantly, Charlie had developed a bit of a drinking problem. He became increasingly violent and Kitty, fearing for the safety of herself and her girls, packed up and immigrated to New York. She opened a boarding house and sent her daughters to expensive schools. Adam begged Kitty to return to London and marry him, but she refused. Charlie spent some time in a Massachusetts prison for that Boylston bank robbery and then headed back to the European mainland. Adam, moping the loss of Kitty, embarked on quite a heist and this one would be his inevitable, albeit indirect, downfall. The May 6th, 1876 sale of Duchess of Devonshire, <sighs> Duchess of Devonshire? Anyway, it was a painting by Thomas Gainsborough and the sale at Christie's in London made quite the sensation. The portrait sold for 10,000 guineas or 51,540, cough, $1.4 million and was purchased by a London art dealer named William Agnew. Apparently, Adam was taken by the portrait as well, and he stole it only three weeks after it had been displayed in the Agnew Gallery. On May 27, 1876, Adam put on some stylish clothes to, as he would later say, elope with the Duchess. Adam and two of his associates, Jack Junka, Phillips, and Little Joe Elliot, yet another short guy it seems, broke into the gallery. Adam delicately cut the picture out of its frame with a razor, rolled it with the paint facing outward, and slipped it inside his coat. They all scrambled outside and ran away without being caught. The theft of the painting was naturally sensational in London, and Adam's name spread through the criminal underworld of the city. It's believed that he stole the painting at first to use as a ransom to get his brother John out of prison, but then his brother was exonerated and Adam just liked the painting, so he kept it. He literally carried it back and forth between two continents and across Europe in the bottom of his trunk for several decades. He had a kind of weird obsession with this painting that we don't need to get into, but let's just say he kept it. Keeping the painting meant that Junka and Lil' Joe would not get their cut of the heist of the world's most expensive painting at the time. And they naturally, I suppose, started to get a little bit impatient. It was in this tumultuous time that Adam himself found love, or at least marriage. He married a widow who apparently didn't have a name of her own and who had no idea her husband, Henry, was a notorious criminal mastermind. 
He was still using the name Henry Raymond, in fact, and it's probable she did not even know his real name. They would have two children, a boy named Henry Jr., I guess, and a girl, Beatrice. In 1892, Adam got word that Charlie had been arrested in Belgium and was gravely ill. Charlie was already dead when Adam made it to Belgium to see him. Throughout this time, the Pinkerton Detective Agency and Willie P were hot on the trail of, well, you guessed it, Adam. In fact, Adam's reputation was such that virtually every major crime in Europe was assumed to be his work, right or wrong. The detective agency had been tasked with finding the Duchess of Devonshire, Devon, Devon <laughs> portrait, and had already identified Adam as the thief. The now 48-year-old Adam, whether to prove he still had it, or sick with grief over the loss of his lifelong friend, engaged in the heist that would be his criminal death knell. Though he was successful in robbing a money transport with two associates, he was arrested before being able to leave the country. And though he refused to identify himself, through photos he was identified as both the money transport thief and the Duchess of, you know, that one, thief. <laughs> Without the theft of the Duchess, Adam may not have been identified in Belgium in 1893. Alas, his trial began on March 20th. Everything the prosecutor had learned about Adam was put to use. Adam categorically denied involvement in any criminal activity, claiming that the most recent heist was an act of stupidity motivated by a need for some fast cash. He declared that the claims made by British and American law enforcement, as well as anyone else about his criminal exploits, were all based on hearsay at best. And any money he earned was from gambling. Legal gambling, heavy emphasis on the legal. Evidently, his defense wasn't good enough and he was convicted of robbery and given a seven year sentence of solitary confinement with hard labor to be served at the prison de Louvain. His time in prison was pretty rough, not least of which was because an enemy he had made in his younger days in New York was in the same prison and hired other inmates to beat up Adam constantly. Adam had also asked one of his buddies to look after his wife, but instead that buddy seduced her and stole all of her money, causing her to have a mental breakdown and to have to be institutionalized. Adam's children at the time with his wife, who were three and six, were sent to America to live with Adam's brother, their uncle, John. Adam was released in 1897, a bit early on good behavior, when he was 53 and headed to see his wife in England. Patients in Victorian England's mental institutions were sometimes subjected to physical restrictions, isolation, and severe punishments for disobedience. Sounds like Sing Sing. In many cases, patients had their own needs and preferences ignored in favor of a strict regimen of labor and recreation. Other common practices included electroconvulsive therapy, lobotomy, and insulin shock therapy. When Adam arrived at the institution, he discovered that his wife was a shell of her former self. It's said that she didn't even recognize he was there. Brokenhearted, he stole 15,000 pounds worth of jewelry and left for America to be with his children. But Adam Worth had a one trick left up his sleeve, or a trump card, I don't know, something. He had leverage, and that leverage was a duchess. So Adam headed to 23 Park Row in Lower Manhattan. Adam and Willie P, P for Pinkerton Detective Agency, remember, met in secret and came up with a deal. No one knows the exact details of what they agreed to, though some say Adam was given $25,000 or $882,000 in today's cashola as payment of a ransom. What we know for sure is that no charges were filed against Adam Worth, and the painting mysteriously reappeared. At the end of their lives, it seems, Willie P. and Adam went from solid enemies to fast friends. Willie P. even got Adam's children a puppy. Adam moved with his children back to London, where he got an apartment in Regent Park, a relatively affluent area of London in the 20th century, and today for that matter. Adam Worth died suddenly in 1902 in London of heart failure, liver disease, and according to the coroner, chronic habits of intemperance. His immune system was compromised from his difficult years in prison. Beatrice and Henry Jr. were at his bedside. He was buried in Highgate Cemetery in North London among the likes of Karl Marx, George Eliot, and Douglas Adams. He was buried in a mass pauper's grave under his alias, Henry Raymond. 
At the time, his son Henry was 14 and his daughter Beatrice was 11. The two would head back to America to be raised again by their uncle John, but interestingly, would receive letters and money from old Willie P. The detective would claim in those letters to have owed a debt to their father. Georgiana of Devonshire, subject of Thomas Gainsborough's portrait, was the great, 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 great aunt of Diana Spencer, Princess of Wales. Almost as soon as the painting was returned to William Agnew, he sold it to a one J. Piermont Morgan, yes, that J.P. Morgan, for a mere $150,000 or 5.6 million modern dollars, but that was barely a drop in the bucket for the financier. He took her home and displayed her above his mantle. After passing down the Morgan family for several generations and spending some time in one of J.P.'s granddaughter's cupboards, she was sold at Sotheby's on July 13, 1994 for 773,000 modern dollars, purchased by the present Duke of Devonshire. After over a hundred years, the lady was finally going home. Kitty Flynn Bullard would meet and marry a wealthy sugar plantation owner named Juan Pedro Terry after immigrating to New York with her daughters. He would informally adopt the older girls and she would be tragically and unexpectedly widowed when she was seven months pregnant with their child. Kitty named their daughter Juanita Teresa after baby Juanita's dad. Kitty would stay in touch with Adam even during his time in that Belgian prison through encouraging letters until her death on March 13, 1894, when she was 41 years old, of Bright's disease, which is now known as nephritis or kidney disease. She was buried in Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, overlooking the Manhattan skyline. The New York Herald would declare, quote, she had lived enough history to make most women old before their youth, end quote. Adam's friend would say Adam, quote, never forgot the winsome Irish barmaid who had won his heart, end quote. Kitty's three daughters would be in a tragic carriage and train accident, and Catherine and little Juanita would be killed. The son of her surviving daughter, Lucy, would go on to found Pan American Airways. Henry Raymond Jr. took advantage of another part of the agreement between his father and old Willie P. and became a career detective at the you guessed it, Pinkerton Detective Agency. I wasn't able to find anything about Beatrice's life after her father's death. It is widely believed that Adam Worth was the model for Sherlock Holmes's most infamous adversary, Professor James Moriarty, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sir Arthur's Napoleon of Crime description of Professor James is said to be based on a real life phrase about Adam, who is also called the Napoleon of the criminal underworld. Numerous biographers and researchers have drawn parallels between the two criminal masterminds, and it is generally agreed that Adam Worth was crucial in molding Sir Arthur's depiction of Professor James Moriarty as the ultimate criminal mastermind. A tombstone was erected in Highgate Cemetery in 1997, engraved with Adam Worth's real name. It also gives him, as an epitaph, the title, The Napoleon of Crime. His nickname has become just one of the enduring parts of his mythos as one of the most famous and notorious criminals of the late 19th century. Adam Worth was a fascinating and complex figure in the world of crime. His legacy has endured in the popular imagination as a testament to his cunning, audacity, and determination. Even his biggest enemy and rival had to admit, quote, Adam Worth is without a doubt the most successful burglar of the present time. No one has ever gotten the best of him, end quote. Thanks for hanging out with me. Adam Worth or Henry Raymond, sounds like a pretty cool guy. Who doesn't like mutton chops? It would have been pretty cool to meet him and pick his brain a bit. He obviously had a pretty good brain in him. Did you know that this week in 2020, 40-year-old Travis Spitzer was waist deep in a lake in Largo, Florida, looking for his frisbee when an alligator grabbed him by his face and tried to pull him into the water? Wanna know if he lived? Go to my Twitter. And just kidding, I'll tell you, he broke free and survived. But go follow my Twitter anyway. Fun stuff, fun stuff. It's at Capers Cocktails, the only one of my social medias without an and. www.capersandcocktails.com has all the links to all the goodies, from booze to videos. Check them out, please. <laughs> In two weeks, a crime I think a lot of kids at least some point think happened to them. Stolen at birth. Just me, 
Maybe it's just me. I'll see you in two weeks. And remember, there are always alternatives to stealing expensive paintings just to keep hidden in your house for 25 years.